So we're here for the personal and workplace effectiveness course, right? And the first um, part we'll talk about is what I call the seven-star employee. The seven-star employee. Now, what does it mean to be a seven-star employee? This concept came from the only seven-star hotel in the world. If we have time, I'm going to show you some images of that hotel, right? Um, before the Burj, it's called the Burj Al Arab. It's a hotel in Dubai. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, anybody ever been there? <laughs> like that. <laughs> Maybe you've been there, you know, on the internet. So, <laughs> you know, we've been there now. <laughs> right? Right, the only seven star hotel in the world, right? Before the Burj Al Arab, the highest rating for hotels was five star. What kind of mind says 100% is not enough? Do you understand what I'm saying? How, how, how did they think, how did they conceive such? Do you understand? The highest rating was five star. And then somebody says, we're not doing five. We're not doing six. We're doing seven. I need to open up that person's brain and see the wiring of that brain that would make somebody think that they can go beyond excellence. It's a mindset. So you can imagine telling that person to clean this room. Imagine how sparkling this room will be. It's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. And I'm saying that can we infuse that thinking in you such that when you are required to carry out a task, when you come back with the delivery of that task, we are in awe of what you did. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? Right? And that's what the seven-star employee is. The seven-star employee is someone who is a master at managing the different stakeholders in the organization. Right? The different stakeholders in the organization and the different stakeholders that we, we interface with. So what are the different dimensions of your relationship here? Number one is this person is the customer's favorite staff. So I don't know who your customer is, but there are people you serve. Whoever it is that you serve is your customer. It might be a, depar a department that is dependent on you. Those guys are your customers. <laughs> the question is the members of that department, do they consider you their favorite staff? Do they consider you their go-to person? Whenever there is a problem, you know how it is, if you need a solution to something and you need to interface with a department, <coughs> right? There's one person that you always call. That person may not have anything to do with what you are requiring, you know, but that person is your go-to person because that person can help you get across to whoever can resolve that issue. My question is, are you the go-to person for the people that you serve? Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yes. Customers don't do business with their favorite organizations or departments. They do business with the favorite service provider in that organization. And your job is to become the favorite service provider. When I think of one person in this department that I want to interface with, the question is, are you top of mind? And what will determine whether you're top of mind is the quality of impression that you give me when you serve me. Did you hear what I said? What will determine whether you're top of mind is the quality of service that you give me whenever I interface with you. And that quality of service will leave an impression on me. Sometimes your job is just to pick a phone to answer a call. But can you answer that phone call in such a way that I will never forget you? The problem is sometimes we think that our, our jobs are too basic. Let me tell you something. There's dignity in labor. What does it mean? Whatever your hands find it to do, do it heartily. If you are a cleaner, clean that place with dignity. You are the CEO of that job. Carry
carry yourself like what you do is impeccably important. So important that everybody has got to pay attention to you. The problem is that she be my job is just to answer phone. And then we do it. We have a laser fair, like a discal attitude to it. Let me tell you, whatever your hands find to do, pick that phone call like your life is dependent on it. Pick it like they just gave you the keys of the brand new G wagon that you've always dreamt of. Did you hear what I said? The problem is most people don't think that way. Right? They are not intentional about leaving lasting impressions on the people that they serve. There are three kinds of impressions that you leave whenever you interact with people or whenever you serve them. Please write this down. The first kind of impression is what I call memorably bad. Memorably bad. That's the first kind of impression. Have you ever met someone for the first time and from your first interaction, they left a bad impression on you? Hello, has that happened? Happens all the time. Or let's say an organization you had to do business with. You called their call center and the person left a bad impression. Or let me ask, have you ever gotten bad service before? Anywhere? Happens a lot in Nigeria, have you? Really bad. Will you forget that bad experience? I can't hear you now. Will you forget the person that gave you that bad experience? I can't hear you. You cannot forget them. Now, can you imagine being unforgettable, but being unforgettable for bad service? Can you imagine that? You can't afford to do that. Sometimes you only have five minutes of interaction, and somebody will judge you based on that five minutes of interaction. So you can't afford to leave a memorably bad impression. The second one is what I call forgettably average. Second kind of impression. And in my own opinion, some people may argue this, so this is the worst place to be. The worst, worst, in my own opinion. It is worse than memorably bad. At least we remember you, even though it's for bad. <laughs> Forgettably average is when we meet you, and it is as though we never met you. Forgettably average is that you served me and then tomorrow, I don't remember you. Does that happen sometimes? You meet someone somewhere and the person says, Ah, so good to see you. And you're wondering, do I know you? And the person goes, Ah, don't you remember? We sat together. You were beside me in that training. How long was that training? Say last week now. Eh. And you don't remember. Right? How can somebody meet you and they have no recollection of you? Does that happen to you sometimes? Don't lie. Don't lie. It happens to you that somebody, somebody you met before, then you now meet the person again, and you know the person, but the person doesn't remember you. Hello, does it happen? Yes. That is what I call forgettably average. Your presence left no impression. Right? The question is, when I meet you, what impression do you leave on me? The, the problem is what I call the absence of an intention to leave the third kind of impression, which is memorably great. That is the problem. And I'm saying this for all the people that you serve. Can you predetermine in your heart that I will serve you in a way that you will never forget me? The problem is people don't intend True story, a friend of mine went to a bank. He was seated in the lobby. And then something happened in the branch. A customer had come in. He got served by a lady. And then when he left, he forgot his phone on the till, on the counter. So he came back like 10 minutes later. And he saw the security man. And he was telling the security man, I just left here 10 minutes ago. I left my phone here. And my phone is no longer there. And the next thing the security man says is, sir, who served you? At least I need to know who served you for me to be able to, you know, trace where the phone is. And the guy goes, I can't remember. All I know is that it was a female that served me. And then the lady who had served him 
had seen the phone and she had kept it, but she wasn't on her desk, but she spots the guy, she brings out the phone from where she kept it, and she walks in his direction only to overhear the conversation that the guy was having with the security man. And then she interjects and she says, hey, I'm the one who served you. I kept your phone. Here is your phone. The guy collects his phone and he's happy. He's like, oh, thank you, and takes the phone away. And then a conversation ensues between the lady and the security man. And the lady was telling the security man, that customer that just left here has a bad memory. Can you imagine? Just 10 minutes ago, he doesn't even remember how I look. My friend who was there overheard the conversation and jumped in and said, sorry to interject to, but madam, you are wrong. She said, what are you talking about? He has a bad memory. He said, no, the problem is not his memory. The problem is the quality of service you gave. If you give him a memorably great service, he will never in his life forget you. The problem is you are ordinary. She had never heard anything like that before in her life. And I'm telling you, that's why a lot of people are where they are in life. Because they wake up every day and they just go, you know, with the routine. Live every day the same way, without a genuine intention to serve everyone in a way that they will never be forgotten. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? I don't know what service you render here. But whatever the service is, the question is, would you leave an impression on me when you serve me? There's a way you can pick up a phone and I will be in awe of you. There's a way you will pick up the phone and you will, you will be forgettable. There's a way you will say good morning and I will remember you. There's a, there's a way you will say good morning and it will sound like every other good morning I have heard, and you cannot stand out by doing the same thing every other person does. Do you get what I'm saying? Every day I have people say good morning. Good morning. It doesn't even sound like the morning is good. <laughs> there are some people I hear, and I hear a ring in their voice. Good morning. Uh -uh. Say, oh, yeah. Just that alone, one phrase, left an impression. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Yes, right? So, let me ask the person beside you, are you a customer's favorite staff? Well, you answer them. Answer the person. <laughs> are you or you're aspiring to be? Mm, very I am. Let's ask the customer. You know, it's easy to say. <laughs> Let's ask the departments that interface with you. Right? The next one is... This person is the dream subordinate of the boss. So whoever the superior is, they are their dream subordinates. That's the seven-star employee. And see, let me tell you something. Eh? As a subordinate, you know, I worked in a bank, so if, if I've worked in environments where there has been hostility, no, it means to be hostile. I've worked in those kinds of environments. You know, and you know, when you work in some of those kinds of environments, you meet people who <coughs> will gather together and they will talk about their boss. And you say, ah, that woman, or oh, that man, he's not nice. And say stuff like that. You know, and at the end of the day, I always used to tell them, see, you can talk from now until tomorrow. It doesn't change anything. You may not have control over your boss, but you have control over yourself. Did you hear what I said? I said, you may not have control over your boss, but you have control over yourself. And you have control over how you react towards whatever your boss gives you. So if you change, you may get your boss to change. But if you are requiring your boss to change, then you may be on a wild goose chase. The question is what adjustments do you need to make to be able to connect well with your boss? You know, a lot of subordinates don't spend time to observe and to study their superiors. If they did, they will connect better with them. 